Greetings and welcome back to Friday's Q&A with Andrew Carlson and the gang here. Really nice to see a good group on here today, and I think we'll probably have a few more on in a little bit. So um, guess what? What? I can't find the questions. Now, you told us last week you couldn't find the October questions, but... Um... Yes, I know, and I made new questions. And I don't know, is it similarity or what? Probably. Questions. I've got lots of questions here. But well, you'll need to find them or just get new ones. But um, okay. since we've got a bunch of people here, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, we, they could certainly suggest topics. Sophia was coming on. She was on for a minute in Alabama and she had questions. And I don't know, maybe she had a little problem. Maybe she'll come back home. But I can always go look back in my email and pick out a few very simply. Unless somebody has one right now. To start out with. I do have uh, something that um, one of my friends asked me who's not on here. Um, but... Uh, I'm going to wait and see if anyone. Vicki said she had emailed you one. Yeah, I'm bringing up my email now. Luke's got one. OK, why don't we start with Luke then, and I'll find the rest of them. Looking for Vicky right now in email. Latest one was October. No, wait a minute. We didn't finish October. Yeah. You had said last week that you lost October's. Okay, here's one. I found the one from Vicky though. And that question is, <sighs> What is the difference between sin and abomination, transgression, and iniquity? I think I sent an answer along to you. Did I not? But let's turn this over to Andrew to give us the definitive answer. <laughs> what is the difference between sin and abomination? Also, what is the difference between sin transgression and iniquity. Thanks. Okay. Let me just type them so I can remember. All right. So from what I can tell, abomination is a, a certain type of sin. Uh, sin is just a general, a general statement. It could be referring to, um, any number of things and uh, scripture seems to have this idea of like the definition of sin is not quite the definition that we use today in religious circles we tend to use religious in religious circles uh, sin to mean something that's immoral whereas the ancients seem to use it more in the sense of uh, error and or imper imperfection. So certainly not all errors or imperfections need salvation or atonement. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna be in trouble because uh, you made an innocent mistake. But that would be an, an innocent mistake under the Bible definition of sin would be considered a sin in a broad sense. Um, there's willful sins scripture speaks of, which you, it's basically you, you are accountable for your error. And then there's uh, transgression. Transgression is, is a more I regard it as a more uh, stronger sense where it's connecting it to morality 
So when you transgress, you are violating a, a moral code. And iniquity, the word iniquity means injustice. And so it's this concept of simply being hypocritical, unfair, uh, a bad judge, uh, not, not advocating for justice, advocating for injustice. And there's all kinds of things that go under that category of injustice, uh, punishing people who, uh, hurting people that don't deserve to be hurt, um, stealing things for yourself. It, it all is covered under injustice. So in injustice, iniquity is like a, a, description and it, it, but many of these things overlap so it's definitely complicated in how it overlaps but I think what I said is the basic gist of it uh, abomination is the stronger type which would be like if you eat unclean animals it's an abomination because it's defiling your body and uh, and uh, also other abominations in scripture would be such as uh, homosexuality and all kinds of other things. So th those would fall under the biblical definition of abomination. Okay, um, I've got definitions too. These yeah, sure. actually, I have, I've looked these and thought about them a lot and thus I was able to answer Vicky. Sin is primarily today we think of sin as a transgression of the Torah. Of course uh, in my church work sin was defined as any kind of unloving act. But I kind of go with the Torah thing. Abomination and you picked the right chapter there Leviticus 11 that's talking about unclean animals being an abomination to you. It's, it means a desecration. Um, turning to war, uh, God word, we would say a blasphemy, but Leviticus 11 talks about you are an abomination to yourself. So desecrating would be very good. You're desecrating your body, and Nazarene Acts talks about that too. I have a different one for iniquity, because there's another way that can be used. And it has to do with one's inborn, innate, genetic tendency towards certain types of sins. So you notice that in Hebrew, it's always talking about sins and iniquities. Iniquities are kind of like pre-programmed sinfulness, like, like a child that is born of a drug addict that child comes out with the iniquity of being already uh, already uh, addicted to the substance, whether it was their fault. Of course, it's not their fault, but they come to that through a genetic or um, a familial spirit or um, a genetic type of inheritance. So that's what I get for those. And Here's another one from Tower Time, real quick, I've got in front of me. I have a question. Do you believe Joseph of Arimathea might have been Jesus' earthly father, husband of Mary, since he was taking care of the burial of Jesus after his crucifixion? Maybe way off, no, it's not way off topic. That's on topic for me, because yes, I do believe that this person called Joseph of Arimathea was the father of Yahshua, or the supposed father, same as Joseph the Righteous in Matthew, and Arimathea, and we mentioned this before, is a bungling of going from, from Aramaic into Greek. I believe it should be Yosef Eri Matia, Joseph his uh, tribe is Ari, his surname is Matya, and we find in the Jesus family tomb 
one bone box that they couldn't account for. The rest, they, the rest in there are Yeshua's family. Whether you believe it or not, of the Jesus family tomb, I hope I, I'm not going to go ahead and define that except to say that it certainly must be authentic because there's too, too big of a chance that it is authentic against that it's not. But the, that one bone box in there, Ashiwari, has the name scribbled on it, Matya, and he doesn't fit in. So the speculation is that that Matya is Matthew the disciple, who evidently was not in any way a member of the family. But if we look at Arimathea, as it would be re-translated back into Aramaic, we get the Matya that is in there, the very same one that the New Testament says it was his tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. Might also add that Arimathea, there is no such place. If you look on your Bible map, it'll have a question mark there, and you'll find Arimathea down in the middle of the Sinai Desert, and <laughs> nothing is there, and they never knew that there ever was such a place. So I think it's a bungling of the original translator getting that into Greek in a Greek term where really we're just talking about um, Joseph, surname Matya. Might also one more thing. As for the successors to Judas, we have uh, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice, and we have Matthias or Matthias. You got these people. Well, you can, if you parse down Joseph Barsabbas, Justice, you get Joseph Barsabbas means a person that with, with a lot of supply or providence, a lot of money. Barsabbas, Justice means the righteous. So he's a Zadik, he's a Zadik priest. Joseph, the one that has a lot of money, who's the priest. And then we have Matthias as Matthia. So Luke is playing a little trick on us there. With those two names, it's two in one. And it is identifying so-called Joseph of Arimathea in these two names. There's a lot more to that, but I'll give you that much just to... Uh, intrigue your mind a little bit. Sorry, sorry, sorry I step in. Uh -huh. uh, I think I, I think we're falling into assumptions and suppositions. Yeah, and his, historic, historic, historically speaking, there's no basis historically basis to say that. Well, Jackson's just sharing his his uh, belief. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, well, we got a, like a lot of responsibility with with with, with people that. But who's to say that that's not the truth? No, but 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 we, we, we can't. We, we we that's what I'm saying. Historically okay. speaking, as a historian, a historian would say that we don't know, and that will be a lot. Uh, 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 that will be like going going over the head, All right. saying that let it me, could be. Let me tell you what Barry Albin said. He said, "Yes, that's the duty of a historian," but he said. Jack, we are not historians. We are theologians. We're allowed the speculation that a historian is not. So but we, I, 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 don't, I don't think we would uh, be getting, or we would be studying the Bible seriously. Okay, who is he? Uh, you hey, no, a Christian tradition. No, 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 no. Uh, there's no, there's no answer. There's no we'll answer. Say, I don't know. We, we can't say we we yeah we don't know. Okay. But we we can't we can't fall into like like creating fables or fantasy stories. But I'm a theologian, not a historian like you. This is my craft. This is uh, what I, I was trained to do this. So you can't disparage me for doing what I do. Okay, okay, Jackson. So, so you tell me that you're a theologian. So, what, what's your basis to say that his is father? Because I haven't heard it. That is what. 
Uh, what's your basis to say that oh. Joseph of uh, Arimathea was his father? I'll be happy because I haven't that. heard it. No, you haven't. It's it. Someone someone asked Jackson the question. I I didn't hear if Jackson said that he believes that or not. No, he yes, says that it true. could be because he says that it could be, and that the, that that that's where I have to step in because we're misleading people. No, we are not misleading people. If you would. If I would suggest to you that you take a look at my essay on this topic, rather than just dismissing somebody's a theologian speculation out of hand, we I would say we can't be that closed-minded, because there is a better answer than I don't know. There's a better answer than that, and besides, there's no better that answer than I don't know because the scriptures doesn't say it. Don't you ever think it. about or speculate it? The scripture doesn't tell us how many times to go to the toilet either. Yeah, we, we you know we, it doesn't tell you. We everything. we can't start inventing or, or creating things out of nothing. Well, well, then I'm in the wrong place if that's the case. I don't belong here. Um, well, this is this is your uh, yeah. This is my thing. <laughs> you're going to get um, speculation whether you like it or not. No, but you're talking about the Bible. The Bible is for everybody. Uh, and, you're, and you're interpreting the Bible. So, of course so, I am. That's what I, my profession is. That's what my doctorate is in and my master's degree. Okay, let, let me see, let me see your basis because I haven't heard uh, uh, a real basis. So let me of just say this. Uh, I wanted to say something. Um, because the scripture uh, uh, distinguishes both Joseph the father and Joseph of Arimathea. In different and they're two places, different people. Different places, different authors. So I want to say something. Um, you have to think critically. I'm Bible thinking study. critically, but I have to I have to hear a, a, a strong basis. May I say something? Well, yes, yes, only. Go Sorry. ahead. Um, so, my understanding of the format of this uh, this thing we do every week is. Um, is for people to ask uh, questions of me and Jackson Snyder to get most of the, most people are of the understanding that Jackson and I don't always see eye to eye on these different topics and subjects. So it's kind of like the way I see it, this question and answer thing is for people to ask a question on a topic and then uh, you have the Jackson Snyder answer, and then you have the Onya answer, and both answers are given to people. And then uh, the people hearing both ideas can then judge it for themselves what they think is more correct. I don't think the, this uh, question and answer thing that we're doing every week is intended to be a um, Bible study necessarily or a... Um, uh, these things are true and then proving it to be true. I think it's more along the lines of Jackson and me saying what we believe and not necessarily why we believe it. Someone may ask question why we believe it, you know, so if, if um, I think the better way to approach it, uh, Walter and other people here who, if, if you hear something that Jackson or I say, which you don't agree with, and of course, we often will say things you might not agree with. Um, we both have our reasons for believing it, whether it be based on the Bible or something else. Um, I think it would be more constructive for our purpose, uh, for for the smooth uh, the smoothness of the meeting. For people, if they have a question, to wait till. The, for them to finish the answer and then to basically say, um, not as an accus accusation or, or, or like a, you don't have any proof for that type of thing, but more on the lines of, I was curious why you believe that, or can you explain why you believe that? Or what do you, what, can you share any evidence that you have that supports that? Which you did try to say, but it also seemed to be um, 
attacking language. And there's a there is a time and place to do that type of thing. But I think for our purposes, we're not necessarily trying to prove all the claims we're making. We're just trying to share our opinion or belief based on our study elsewhere. And then um, if you have a question, um, I think the be best way to do it is, um, so for the chat box, I think it'd be good uh, for you to type, type uh, the question. That way we can look at your question and because sometimes the questions can go all over, all over the place. And I think it's good to try to focus on a, a well-ordered um, questions. Because, and uh, there were some things that were asked earlier that I wanted to finish that we kind of got ahead of ourselves and went to the next question. Um, so I, I just want to make sure we don't jump all over the place and, and introduce a bunch of different topics like you know, you, we, we brought up a lot of topics in the last five, 10 minutes. Um, whereas I think the main point is the question was asked uh, about Joseph Arimathea uh, being Joseph's father. Jackson would, was giving his answer. My answer is I don't believe it. Uh, I don't, I personally don't believe that Joseph is um, Joseph, the father, uh, is the same as Joseph Arimathea. Um, I would be interested to see why Jackson believes that. Jackson said he he wrote some something on that subject on his website, so maybe he could share us share well, I, with us. I do um, have uh, one very adept scholar's yes on this, and I do have a full reckoning of it, which I can't give here. This is this is the one it's for. But as host of this with Onia, I don't expect to bring a speculation on here and be attacked. Uh, so, so, so we, so you, you guys, uh, I see that you guys can't have like a conversation with somebody. That's, were, not, that's were, not attacking. You weren't conversing. You were just telling me. And the people that say that the Bible well, has because to we're, we're 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 playing with with people's uh, faith and beliefs. No, we're and we, not. we can't mislead people. That's not what we're doing here. We are answering the questions in the best way that we can. That was a question that came up, it was probably a ringer from Tower of Time, knowing him. But we answer those questions the best we can. If you have an objection to it, you can't simply say the Bible proves the Bible because it doesn't, or that this or that thing is is not adequate to uh, bring evidence to the Bible. When you don't know the fullness of the answer, how can you criticize it? Besides, my stuff here has always been for thinking believers, not people that have all the answers. Take a look at your chat. Also, everything, um uh everybody has a different view on the bible and the, the the fact is um you will have like a bunch of different groups of people s uh saying that the bible says something and sometimes they say two completely opposite things you know you have i know um, that but this isn't this isn't the case are you are you going to be raptured away someday walter uh i believe so oh no, I want proof of it. I've asked you. A no, because uh, biblical proof. It's 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 up to God. It's up to God. Oh. I can, uh, biblical proof that that's in yeah that you First Thessalonians. That doesn't prove anything. Paul's talking about what's going to happen in the near future, not what's going to happen two thousand years later. He says that. So, uh, but, but 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 your question is I'm the rapture. Trying, I am just rhetorically trying to turn this on you as well so you'll understand better what i am talking about you have a certain belief you don't have any reason for believing it except that it was in a certain part of the new testament maybe mm. some parts of the new testament are not for you are is the letter to the galatians for you it's for the galatians uh -huh. is the letter of romans for you no it is not 
It was, this was put together by theologians of the fourth century to show you what these early writers wrote. And then you have to be the judge and judge with right judgment. If you're not going to judge it all or just take whatever it says for whatever your need is, like 3 John 2, I wish you all to prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers, and say, that's for me. It's not for you. Hmm. I understand that. All right, good. So let me say this. Um, like, like I said with the Q&A setup that we have here, let's say Jackson was to say, like let's say a question was asked and someone would say, is, is, um, is God the devil? Because, you know, Gnostics believe God's the devil. Mm -hmm. So if Jackson was to say, yes, he's the devil, and then I was to say, no, he's not, people watching this, uh, listening to this Q&A, would hear one person saying yes, and the other person saying no. So who are they to believe? Are they, are they going to believe the yes, or are they going to believe the no? Um, so I, I think because we're, 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 we're portraying both sides, I don't think we mislead people uh, in that sense, because we are, uh, it's not like Jackson is only sharing his, his claims. He's allowing the, my counterclaims because mo much of the time, my claims are very much counter to what Jackson's saying and often agrees with what you're saying, Walter. So, um, so keep in mind that this, uh, this is not a vacuum of what Jackson's teachings are. It's, it's comparing and contrasting. This is what Jackson believes. This is what Onya believes. And then, and then you could ask for clarifications, further follow-ups. Uh, 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 yeah, but can we stick like to the sources? He's simply a, the answering the question. So, for, so for example, if so, I can't. I can't give my opinion. Yes, you can, but it's an opinion. You told me I was wrong. Right off, the and time. I showed you why, Mr. You Jackson. I, I showed you why. Why? How can you say uh, well, when I when I get when I gave you my response? I showed you why. You need because to because there's no there's no proof in the Bible. You have to be a thinking believer. You have to think outside the box here. It's time for you to learn that. You have to use every source that you can and formulate your own belief, not just take a belief of a dispensationalist or what or, or what uh, Benny Hinn told you. No, oh, that that's why that's why I'm 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 always. Uh, uh, I always stick to the Bible and the source. Well, that's your problem. There's also archaeology. So, there's tradition. There's history of that time. There's Josephus. I, ta I take that there into account scholars. as well. Okay. You did but but I, I was asking you if you have if you have that response if you have that answer just just give proof of it because so he, his answer was that he he wrote uh, he has written a paper elsewhere on his site where he gives um, arguments why he believes it. And then I would suggest other people who may be interested in that topic, look at what he has to say. And I don't think Jackson, it's Jackson, I don't think it's his intent to prove the claim. Because we're, we're falling like into like an ego now that ah, you attacked me, so I'm looking bad. That's, that's not the idea. An ego? So, like, like an ego. Ego, ego is stepping right. into, into the Let's scene. Let's just get past this and go on to the next. This was a question that was addressed, and I tried to answer it from my perspective. All right? Why don't you try answering it from your perspective by looking at the question? I, I already did. Okay, what's your Historically answer? Historically speaking, we don't know. Okay, that's your answer. I have a different answer. Only it might have a different answer. But 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 okay. but the source is the Bible and the scriptures. Well, the source is 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 what we believe. That the the setup of this is um intended 
to for us to share our beliefs uh, on the subject. And we're not trying to we're not trying to force people here to believe what we believe. We're, we're just sharing our perspective and you guys can share your perspective, but we, we just ask that we do it in a constructive way and not in a way that we are um, talking down to each other. So like Jackson said, we, um, let's, let's oh, move, I, I, move I, I, understand, I understand that Jackson is, is, a, is, a, is a monster, is a professor, is, is he knows a lot. And his, his been a professor so is is even a minister. Now, if I was Robert Eisenman, I'd say, Jackson, get him out of here. I'm not <laughs> going any farther unless you get him out of here. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but I don't know. There's like uh, different opinions. I happen to be one of them, and I'm just saying my 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 answer, my opinion. So let's say, let's say let's say you're in a um, let's just say you're in a church because on a very rare occasion I go into a, a church to for to like you know uh, around Christmas time or things like that just to spend time with family not not to participate yeah um, and there's a sermon um, now we most of us n understand that even if there's total heresy being preached from the pulpit that it is that it is not really appropriate to speak out at a, at a church service and say you are speaking heresy and blasphemy and whatnot. Um, I think the important thing is, you know, do uh, do unto others as you would want done to you. So you know, you wouldn't want someone interrupting your worship service. So don't interrupt their worship service. Okay, in that, so, in that so, understanding, so this is like a like a service. It's not I a service. It was like a it's not a service, but it's a, it, it's a conference. It's 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 not um, it's well, not it's not in, intended so to it's that's not intended to be a Bible study. It's intended to be a conference uh, to to share primarily to share Jackson and, and my ideas, uh, my belief, our beliefs on the subjects. But okay, let's go on. That means 20 seconds in the waiting room for you, Walter. Mm -hmm. So if you if, waiting room. if if someone has a question, they need to um, type it and and so that we can see their question and d d determine if if we want to address it or not. I think that's a better way to to go. There, you had your punishment. Now let's go on. <laughs> 10 seconds in the waiting room. All right. Um, so I did want to uh, go way back to the beginning of um, for the iniquity thing. Um, the way they translate iniquity, the, the word iniquity means injustice. So if Jackson is right that it, of what it means, it would have to be incorrectly translated. Well, it's and, an injustice for a sin. It's an injustice in, in that the person has a propensity that he didn't choose. That's why it's an injustice. Uh, the, reason, the way I get that is by looking at how it's used in primarily right. the Old Testament. Right. So I'm saying that um, if you're right on how it's used, I would argue that uh, iniquity is probably not the, the proper translation. Um, I would think there would probably be a better translation to, to capture what you're saying. Well, we ought to take a look at the original language, see what it is. Yeah, there's so many instances of, of, um, of things like that. Um, uh, let's see here. And then along that line of thought, Vicki had done a follow-up earlier where she said, um, David asked for forgiveness for his iniquity, Psalm 51. Is it like a character flaw? So Jackson, you were saying that um, it's basically the propensity to yeah, do sin? It, it's, not, it's not considered a sin unless somebody expresses it. And then they can say, oh, that was a sin. It's my body, like Paul says, you know, this is my body that sins and retracts doing it anymore. 
then you have both of them that have come out at one, one point or the other as a skin. Like propensity, I wrote on here, like the propensity to be an alcoholic. It's inequitable. It's nothing that you can control in yourself except through willpower or prayer or character flaws or sociopathy. That's a, that's a big one. And that's what I found through just looking at the places where we find it in the Torah that it stands alone. What does it mean? And we need something like that. We need a word like that to, to help us to understand that we are all burdened with these things. One or the other, we're burdened with them. They don't need to be sin if we can keep them from being sin. Unfortunately, they usually become sin because you're going to grow up in an atmosphere where that is happening and you will probably follow it too. But that's, that's my explanation. For Psalm 51, I think, um, I, I think that, uh, that the, that David is simply asking uh, forgiveness for the injustice he did to um, Uriah uh, and how he cruelly treated him and how he mistreated Bathsheba. Um, but I am open to Jackson's um, suggestion of a different meaning because I know I've seen places where these Hebrew words are not translated properly. So I want to study that Hebrew word more and see what it truly means. I'll have to do my own study on that sometime. Could um, I interject real quick, Anaya, about sure. David and what you just said? I guess what I, when I, at, when I brought David into it, as far as iniquity goes, because David had the propensity to um, collect wives, if you will, did that, could that have entered into or influenced him as an iniquity, if we're going to use Jackson's definition of it? Is because he possessed that iniquity of collecting wives, that had something to do with how he was just so quick to go after Bathsheba and yeah. how he was then so quick to go after Uriah because Uriah he murdered. I think but that's I a very good example. Take a look at this, the Greek here, Poneria. And you can see that that could well have something to do that with that. And in what yeah, because I thought it was like a character flaw. Like he was saying, you have a propensity toward yeah. alcoholism or it, it's a character flaw. You know, they're, they're, we've all met people or known people or heard of people who you hear the saying, you know, he would, he would rather lie when the truth would sound better. Some people just have a propensity just to be less than honest and to just lie and if you do something over and over and over and over throughout your life it becomes a character flaw and isn't that what happened with David he certainly wasn't like that at the time that he slew Goliath he didn't have this right. character flaw of collecting wives therefore like a domino effect with Bathsheba I think that's what I was really trying to get at if that elaborates any it makes any more sense i'm not sure so i i wouldn't personally consider uh david's wise to be a character flaw in the sense you're talking about um because i i would i would regard it that that to be more solomon's prerogative of uh solomon's character flaw where he he uh, was full of lust, you know, he married uh, women of other religions uh, who worshipped other, other gods or, or at least idols. Um, and, and, you know, the scriptures speak of how Solomon's heart was completely led astray and he became a very wicked man and he wasn't really repentant until possibly the end of his life. Um, what about Deuteronomy 7, I think it's 17? Yes. I believe so, it is. 
Yep. Do not um, do not have wives. If you're a king, especially, do right. not have wives and horses and you do know, not multiply. Yeah, do not right. multiply. Do not multiply. Yeah. Okay. So, can 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 I say something? So I guess uh, Anaya is what I'm can saying. Can you can you is, type it? Can you type it, Walter, please? I guess Anaya, that's what I'm getting at. I, I get what you're saying about uh, Solomon. I do, but because. David allowed himself to number one disobey Yahweh in that he multiplied wives as sovereign of Israel. Therefore, that's one domino down, then another domino, until eventually those dominoes end up at Bathsheba. And then it become it by that time it is an iniquity. It's part of his character and what he is allowed to become as his character. That's my argument. Okay, so, so so my perspective is that David's... So remember how I said earlier the definition of sin is, um, is uh, different than what we might call sin. So sin would be any type of error, whether it be immoral or not. And so my understanding of Scripture is that David was in a sin of ignorance when he had multiple wives he was in a sin of ignorance according to the dead sea scrolls the damascus document tells us that david did not have access to the book of the law so he did not know until the later portion of his life that it was against the law to have multiple wives um there it says the law was locked into the ark the Ark of the Covenant. We're, we're told in Scripture the law was placed into the Ark. Damascus document tells us that the, the law was sealed in the Ark and no one had access to it. The, the regular people did not have access to it. Um, and that is why it, sa it tells us that David had multiple wives because, because he did not know better. Um, but Scripture tells us that uh, the Ark of the David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. So I believe, based on that statement, that David, once the Ark was brought to him, the Ark was then opened, and then he, then the priest read to him the Book of the Law, and there's evidence that David repented of of uh, multiple wives because, for example. Um, one of his wives, uh, one of the wives, na uh, the name was um, Michal, I think it was. Yeah. Oh, and on it, on, it's, on it, it's let, me, let me finish. Hold on. Uh -huh. um, so Michal, um, it says that when David ran away, Saul gave Michal to another man. And then when David came back into the picture, he, he took Michal back. But then Michal um, kind of was uh, disrespectful towards him because David was dancing. And the scripture tells us that David never slept with her again. Um, so there's certain things like that which leave open the possibility that David, it was not necessarily a, a character flaw in the sense that David was a, a lustful man, um, as a character flaw, I believe that I believe that David. Let, let me tell you guys a uh, personal story here. I'm not going to name any specifics because um, uh, because I've never told the person about this. So years ago, I was um, talking with a friend that I met on YouTube, and. She was, she's a messianic person. And at the time I had some really weird views about marriage. I basically believed that if you don't keep Sabbath, your marriage is not valid. And therefore, if you are married, we, people have the right to try to make you guys divorce. If, if you're married to a non-Sabbath keeper, you should not be married. And someone who's righteous should just like just like someone would would righteously try to get you out of an abusive relationship, I thought a righteous person would try to help 
a someone in a marriage with a non Sabbath keeper get out of that marriage. So I was trying to convince. No, I, ne I never, I never actually went through with uh, telling her to leave. But in my mind, I was thinking about telling her to leave her marriage. Also, I was interested in her, and I was considering eventually telling her my interest in her. And also, of strange coincidence, her husband was away in the army. So that's an interesting parallel with Bathsheba's um, husband being away in the army. So I believe, based on my personal experience of something very similar, almost happening to me, um, I believe that David thought that he was not doing anything wrong. And the reason I think he thought that is scripture actually speaks very strong words against Hittites, does it not? I believe there's a place in scripture where it condemns the Hittites to destruction. Well, Uriah was a Hittite. So if he was a illegitimate person, David may have been along the lines of thinking, well, he's a Hittite, so he doesn't, he, his marriage is not really valid with Bathsheba. So uh, he may have justified it in, in that sense. Um, and also, interestingly, um, he did not actually murder Uriah. He is guilty and responsible, but it was not a direct thing. It was in war. He, he allowed it to happen, but it was ultimately the enemy that killed Uriah. Um, and there's a place in the, in the Law of Moses which says that if a, if a woman is um, a slave and she is betrothed to a man, um, and she sleeps with another man, it is adultery, but there's to be no death penalty because she was not freed. So there are certain things like that that may suggest that while it was adultery and while it was a form of murder, it is not, it was not quite at the level of a straight out murder and a straight out adultery. So there's different things with that story that I think uh, change it a little bit for me anyways. Anyways, uh, Walter, you were going to say something. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys read my statement. Polygamy? Uh, let me see. Yeah, polygamy. Uh, at that time, it, it was a patriarchal era. Uh, polygamy was allowed because that was their tradition, the Middle East tradition. Does the Bible uh, say that? No, no, it doesn't. Yes, uh, you're right. You're right, Jackson. It doesn't say that, but that was their tradition. Oh, I thought we needed the Bible to prove things like no, that. No, and the Bible, does. it doesn't say anything think, about, about polygamy. Okay, thank you. Snyder, and the Bible, doesn't, it doesn't condemn polygamy because that was the tradition. Does the Torah not condemn polygamy? No. No, it doesn't, except for the king. But then again, only is right when he says that uh, David didn't have the Torah. For what, for what, what king, Mrs. Snyder? Except for the king. Uh, the king. Can, you give, can you give me the text? Uh, it's, it's in Deuteronomy, but also it's in the Temple Scroll. Yeah. Uh, the Temple Scroll actually goes into much greater detail. And the temple scroll, as I've discussed my personal belief based on evidence I've shown in other teachings. Uh, do, do you have the numbers of the text so I can write it uh, down? It's 11Q19. That's the name of the scroll. 11 in Deuteronomy. 11Q19. Uh -huh. um, the passage is... 11Q19. I forget the exact columns, but I'm just going to tell you, I believe... You should, and, and, read, you should read the surrounding columns anyway. So just read columns 55 to 60, and you'll, you'll see it there. It's in, it's in that section. 50. 55 to 60. It'll be in there. And then for comparison purposes, 
You and, can and, read Deuteronomy chapter 17. Yes. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it says, A king shall not multiply wives, multiply horses, and he shall not greatly multiply gold. So, uh, but, but, but that's very different from, from marrying a lot of women. So it's, the, it's open for discussion. What does it mean to multiply wives? Some, it's, not the same if, it's not the same if I multiply gold or horses. Well, and it's the it, same context. It doesn't say multiply gold. It says greatly multiply gold. It says, it says do not multiply wives, do not multiply horses. So, so uh, okay. It doesn't, it doesn't say do not multiply in, in gold. In my interpretation, well, well, not my interpretation, well, 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 what I can get out of it is that uh, don't be greedy. Don't be greedy with the gold, with the horses, and with the wives, but it doesn't condemn polygamy. So, okay, so the difference between the three, t tell me what you think the difference is, okay? So the first is do not multiply wives, do not multiply horses, and do not greatly multiply gold. So what do you yeah. think, what do yeah. you think, why do you, why do you think it doesn't say do not multiply gold? For example, we have the same, we have the same context that is, uh, we're talking about the same thing in the Ten Commandments. Don't take anything from, 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 uh, from, from, from your friend, uh, uh, like, like, uh, uh, I don't know if it says horses, house, and it includes wife because it's been seen as a property. Okay, so can you answer the question that I asked them? Um, uh, why do you think for the first two, wives and horses, it says do not multiply them? I'm uh, I think that he's talking about greed also with the um, wife. Okay, so my question is why do you think for the first two, it says do not multiply them, but for the third one, it says, do not greatly multiply. What do you think the difference is between multiply and greatly multiply? What's the difference? Well, I think it's irrelevant. I think it's, no, it's not about the same thing. It's not the same thing because one is multiply and the other is greatly multiply. As if to say, from my understanding, according to Deuteronomy 17, it is not wrong to multiply gold. His, in, it's, in, it's in, that wrong text, to... in that text that you're mentioning, it is, mm -hmm. not, is not condemning have multiple wives. Okay, but that's not, what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. Please listen to what I'm saying, okay? Um, so the passage says, do not greatly multiply gold. That seems to say that you are allowed to multiply gold. Uh -huh. You're just not supposed to greatly multiply it. Yes, that's how I understand it. Okay, so what do you think, what do you think greatly multiplying gold is since it's acceptable according to that chapter. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. I don't think it's changing anything. It's talking about ambition. Like don't don't no, be No, it's greedy. saying you're you're allowed to multiply gold. Uh -huh. it's saying. So so you're allowed to be ambitious? Uh, 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 ambitious is not the word. I would say greed. Okay, so not, here's not how I here's how I interpret it, okay? What what's a multiple one is one, right? And a mul what's two? Two is a multiple. It's more than one. The, the definition of the word multiple is two or more. So the way I interpret it is when it says do not multiply, it's saying do not have more than one. According to the Gospel of Thomas, it says a man, it basically says a man should not try to ride on two horses at the same time. The implication being you're supposed to have one horse. And um, uh, up, yes, uh, up uh, to the compare it to modern times. We we have cars, right? You only need one car. To have more than one car would be unnecessary, luxurious, and greedy. If you have a wife, well, you're two people, right? So you could make an argument: husband and wife each have their own car. That's fine, but. If, if the husband has two cars, the wife has two cards, your, each of your kids has two cards, two cars, that's unnecessary luxury. It's, yeah. and, it's, and that's wrong. It's, no, no, it's not, it's, it's not wrong, but it's unnecessary. And that's what the text is talking about. But uh, up to the first century, 
the tradition among, among the Middle Eastern people uh, was declining a little bit about polygamy because uh, Jesus spoke, spoke about it too. Uh, but that was like around second, first century that they were like not, 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 not being polygamous. The Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls had documents which apparently, according to their documents, Polygamy is outlawed, and um, like I said, uh, check on your own time, the Temple Scroll sometime. Yes, I'm going to check it. I'm going to check it um, right, the, right now. The but remember scroll, that is the Essenes' opinion, right? Well, the Temple Scroll is not the Essenes' opinion. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, uh, that's scroll. okay. But the, the, the Damascus document is their opinion. 11Q19 is Temple Scroll? Yeah. Whereas I have to check it. Damascus document says... Damascus document explicitly says polygamy is wrong for all people, um, and that's their opinion. But the Temple uh -huh. Scroll doesn't say it's wrong for all people. It says it's wrong for kings. Um, and the Temple Scroll is not opinion. It claims to be the word of Yahweh himself. So it's yes, either, so it's it. either prophecy or mm -hmm. it's a false prophecy. I, I'm going to check it. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. So with, with my understanding of the passage of Deuteronomy 17, we are not to have more than one wife. I know you disagree with that interpretation, but that's my interpretation. Mm. And also we are not to have more than one horse. However, we can have more than one piece of gold because the command is not to it doesn't say do not multiply gold, do not have more than one gold. It says do not greatly multiply. So that means don't be greedy with way too much. Um, so that's how I interpret that. Um, Walter, uh, we're going to move to a different topic, but still, yes, yes, yes. But still look at that topic I'm, I'm for yourself. Right I, I would... Mm -hmm. uh, and it, Temple Scrolls is, is one of the most amazing... Yes, I, I, documents I'll, that I've I'll shared with you guys. Um, okay, Luke's gone. Well, um, Luke did ask some questions, but uh, since he's gone, I'm thinking maybe we would save it for a different time. Um, Jackson, can you bring a different question? If you're still there. Yes, I'm sorry. I was muted and didn't know it. That's okay. Um, I'm seeing all these things in the discussion chat that I yeah, have not been following that, up with. Because, uh, because that will be valuable for those listening to this online. The discussion chat? Yeah, yeah through, the, through the chat. Make note of some of those things that you feel need to be addressed. So, okay. So we're not going to talk about, we're not going to debate this subject, okay? But I did want to say, the problem with saying the Bible says that we have to rely on the Bible um, is that we have a few things. One, what is the Bible? The different churches disagree on which books should be part of the Bible. Secondly, different manuscripts of the Bible, which have different readings. I have shown evidence, and I have a lot more evidence that I haven't shown people, of radically different variants between the different manuscripts of books of the Bible for the Old Testament and some, some also for the New Testament. So there's manuscripts which change the meaning of passages. There's translation issues. I've shown evidence of corruption by scribes of our manuscripts. Um, we have proof that history contradicts some things that scripture says uh, in certain places. So with all this in consideration, and like I said, there's apocryphal books, which not everybody agrees to be scripture. A lot of believers reject Paul's writings. Now, some of us might, some people might think it's not a big deal if you, accept Paul's writings or not, others think it's a big deal. And that if you don't accept Paul's writings, you're a heretic. But even if you believe that, you have to understand that people are coming from a different perspective. 
And so you can't quote Paul's letters to someone as proof to someone who does not accept Paul as an authority. Just like you can't, um, you can't quote to an atheist, the Bible says this, therefore you should stop doing, like let's say, let's say an atheist is um, committing adultery. You can't quote to the atheist and say, the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. The atheist is going to laugh in your face and say, who cares about the effing Bible and, you know, whatever. You know, I'm going to live my life, the atheist says. So um, you have to understand that the person you're talking with may not have the same view of the Bible as you. And because of that, you can't necessarily appeal to the Bible on the same level as you might personally believe. Um, so with Joseph, for example, uh, Joseph's father, there's debate about whether Joseph's father was actually the literal biological father of the Messiah or not. Some believe he was, some believe he wasn't. Um, you know, whether the virgin birth is true or not, it boils down to. And then there's discussion of who were the brothers and sisters of the Messiah? Were they his literal uh, full siblings? Did Joseph and Mary sleep together and have all those kids? Or were those his, um, his uh, step siblings? Because a step sibling is a, a sibling by marriage. So some apocrypha claim that it was step siblings. Gospel of James says it was step siblings. Um, then there's a book called the, the uh, Book of Joseph the Carpenter which claims to be a testament of the father of the Messiah. Well, on his deathbed, Joseph reviews his life story and, t and tells us that he ate unclean animals when he was a son. He, he you know, when, excuse me, when he was a young child or a teenager or like a young adult, he, you know, he struggled with lust uh, and different sins of his youth. And he repents of that and he regrets the sins of his youth. And there's discussion about Enoch and Elijah by the Messiah to his disciples. And it talks about death and what the cold, harsh reality of death. So for someone like me, I accept that document as evidence about Joseph's life, the father of the Messiah. But because not everybody agrees with that document, for, for most people, I'd have to tell them, well, that's what this book says. It's possible that book's wrong, but that's what I believe based on that book's authority with the understanding that that book could be false. So Jackson's point of view, whatever it may be based on, however flawed it may be or accurate it may be, he bases it on something. Um, a, a lot of his beliefs are based on Josephus and some similarities between what Josephus says and what the New Testament says. So he does try to use historical sources and try to make sense of it from what the Bible says. Uh, so I, I just want to say that we're not all on the same page when it comes to what the, what the Bible means and what authority the Bible has. So we, gotta, we have to keep that in mind when we're discussing with each other because we don't, we, we don't all have the same religion, essentially. We have our own unique faiths, our own unique beliefs. Um, so that's why uh, I don't think we necessarily need to support everything we say from the Bible, um, and that while I would disagree with Jackson's conclusions, I wouldn't say he's wrong because he can't support it from the Bible. I would just say I, I personally think that his evidence is weak. Everybody disagrees with my conclusions until they read where they and we have from. Yeah. same with you Until to be fair to be fair i have not really read most of your arguments for those things right. so if i did read them maybe i would change my mind a few people have you might change your mind certainly certainly a lot of the things that you have said in the past i've changed my mind about when i get into it and especially the the temple scroll thing that was one of the best essays i ever read or tried to read Wh who's <laughs> not Whose mom is on right now? Snyder, don't forget to send me your, your essay, please. 
Walter, I love you. It's I'm it's going on, to it's, read it. it's on Jackson's website, but if you if Jackson wants, he can send it to I'll you. I'll send it to you in a message. I will read it. Thanks. But I need to uh, I need to get your email address. Did you send okay. that? I'll, to put, me? I'll put it right now. Okay. So let me see what else we got here. Um, this uh, was asked by Luke. We will let's touch on it, even though he's not here. He asked this way in the beginning. Um, the is unconditional love uh, from God biblical or not? Or in other words, not necessarily is it biblical, but what do you do? You believe that God loves unconditionally, or do you think he has conditions to his love? Jackson, you, you, you share your view. That's a hard one because there are places where prophetically Elohim says that he hates this or that, and specifically people that he hates. Like, let's see, who was it? Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. But the Bible also talks about perfect hate. And of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls say, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. So it's got to be qualified by uh, some means. And I have a tendency to follow the scrolls in that. Yeshua says, love your enemies, but that doesn't mean to feign over your enemies and to uh, love has to do with tough love as well as easy love. It says someplace that Elohim doesn't want to bar anybody's path to salvation. In fact, the Bible is the book of salvation history, the entire thing. So I think there are two different definitions here of this. Yes, I do think that he loves unconditionally, but he's bound to covenants that say that though, say to the ones who love him back, that yes, you're going to have a restoration of creation. You're going to have the resurrection of dead. You're going to have the judgment. And a uh, father, like a father, he can love both sons, but he is going to favor one son in his judgments oft times because that son was obedient and the other one wasn't. That's rather, that's not a nailed on definition, but it's it makes sense to me. He's going to love me, he's going to love my heathen neighbor as well, but he's not going to respond as he to to the neighbor as he would to me, yet he still loves. Love is not just a fond feeling. Love is a concept that works, that's working all the time. A concept that doesn't simply mean what the world means, uh, erotic love, or to coddle someone. It, it means to do what's best for them in all cases. Unfortunately, even Elohim can't go against a person's free will. That would be my answer to that. Thank you. Uh, so, so I would say God loves everybody and he also hates many people. So, um, the thing you have to keep in mind is you can do both at the same time. So, for example, have you ever had a family relative that you love a lot, but you also, they get on your nerves and you argue with each other and you, you fight with each other? That's an example of someone that you both love and, in a sense, you're hating them because you're treating them badly. Um, you're doing yeah. hateful, hateful things to them. Hate doesn't necessarily mean the most strongest form where you want them to die and you don't care about them at all. That's only the most intense form of hate. But like Jackson talked about, there's a perfect hatred. Um, a perfect hatred 
is wanting someone to stop being evil and rejecting the evil in someone. So if someone's a thoroughly evil person, you reject them, therefore you hate them because you oppose them. So let's say for example, someone who is living a homosexual lifestyle or an adulterous lifestyle. You, you reject that lifestyle. You oppose them. You're opposed to their, their life. So you hate who they are, but you love the good parts about them. Let's say, let's say they, um, give to the, they, they, they give food to the poor and they clothe the, the naked um, and they're very charitable. Those are really good things and th that's worth loving people for doing those things. So I think, you know, the scripture says that, that God judges us by our works. So if you do good works, you're going to be judged good for those works. He's going to love you for those good works. If you do bad works, he's going to hate you for those bad works. So um, I, think it, I think love is conditional. He, the condition is you have to do something good for him to love you, or you have to be something good to be loved. We're all, we all have a little good in us. So in that sense, he unconditionally loves us only in the sense that the condition everybody has. So it feels like it's unconditional because everybody has at least one good condition. What's one good condition? We all exist. That's good. So he loves the fact that we exist. What's another good condition? Um, I don't know. There's, diff there's different kinds. But, you know, if you, if you do something good and loving to someone else, that's a good condition. So he's going to love you for that condition. If you do something evil or sinful, he's going to hate you for that condition. So that's my take on it. So getting, we have 10 minutes left. Let me see if there's another question. Um, let's see here. Um, does anybody have uh, anything on their mind that they want us to touch upon the last uh, 10 minutes? Oh, Jackson uh, went, uh, he went to the boys' room. I'll ask something. Okay. What do you think about the um, epistle of Barnabas? And is it scripture? And what do you think about what he said about the eighth day? I like that. So, okay, so... Uh, let me just type it in for a sec. Um, before we talk about that, Laura, were you asking a question earlier about he died for us? Was that intended to be a question? If you want, you can just type. You can type uh, if you don't want to talk. Uh, but I was confused because you said he died for us, question mark. And I'm not sure if that was a uh, question. Oh, that is that for the conditional? That's for the conditional. Um, yeah, if my people will repent, then I will forgive. Um, so Jackson, are you back or no? Okay, he's not back yet. Looks like. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, Walter, have you uh, listened to some of our past um, Q and A's? I know you've been you've you've participated in some of them, but have you listened to recordings of them or no? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I'm still searching for the Dead Sea Scroll text. Um, so go to Google, do, do a Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition PDF. Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition PDF. Anyone else could do this too. If you don't have this, I recommend Google search Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition PDF, and it'll, you'll have a PDF download 
of that two volume set. It'll have all the Dead Sea Scrolls that are not the biblical ones. It's all the extra biblical, it's all the extra books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in those books, there's a document called the Temple Scroll, which I was talking about, 11Q19. It's near the end of the PDF file. And it's basically an older version of the Book of Deuteronomy. But uh, the reason I, I was asking, Walter, is because if you watch some of our prior Q&As, some of the weeks, I'm about to sneeze. Um, some, yeah, it's, it's uh, I don't think you need to update. I think there's only that one from 1999, the Dead Sea School Study Bible. So um, if you look at our past uh, Q&As, it was, some weeks was very good and we didn't really have a heated back and forth. Other weeks, we did have a heated back and forth. And I've noticed a pattern of the heated back and forth. When that happens, it happens when someone starts debating um, what Jackson or I are saying. They're debating it and arguing, uh, arguing with us. And I think, I think what we're trying to do in this Q and A is not to argue and debate. I think that's not what we're trying to do. Instead, we're simply sharing our belief. And then if you guys want, you can share your belief. We, we, we want to try to stay away from the arguing and debating because then it starts getting, we start talking over each other and we got to keep in mind that this is not just for us. We are also recording this for other people to listen to. And so a lot of people will just simply not want to listen to us uh, yelling back and forth at each other and it's all chaotic and there's no order. So I appreciate you trying to look out for people and you know, you know, you don't want people to be led astray into false information, but from people listening to the call, it's very chaotic and disorganized. So I would appreciate it going forward for anyone participating in our Q and a sessions that we just calmly share our perspective, but in a way that's not arguing, it's not debating, but if you want to share your point of view, like in this case, Walter would have said, you could have said, I, per, you could have said, I want us to say my view on this. My personal view is that I don't see anywhere in scripture that it talks about this. And because of that, I think it's a big maybe. I don't think it's definite. I think, that, and I think that's all you should have said. I don't think you should have tried to convince Jackson he's wrong or try to demand him to show evidence. I think that's where it started getting uh, a little bit heated. Um, so I'm going to get heated. That's just, well, that's just the testosterone coming out. But <laughs> some people, according to the comments, like to hear that. I'm well, maybe we can, maybe we can start doing point. that more then. Well, <laughs> I, I feel like there's times that I wasn't trying to be argumentative at all, and Jackson took it way wrong and got offended and thought I was attacking him. And I'm like, hey, Jackson, I like you. That's why I'm here. I'm not what trying to be that? mean. Are you too sensitive, Jackson? Yes, I'm very sensitive. Yes, you need this? to lighten up a little bit. This is. I think I know who this is. Tell me. Melissa. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Yes, you got, you got extremely defensive. Then on the comments, you said you got your way. So, okay, okay. That's fine. Yes, I'm going to get defensive because I was a church pastor for 30 years. Well, don't get defensive. It's just people well, sometimes, have But sometimes people can be very uh, sensitive. accusatory. So, <laughs> Well, if they're mean, then they need to go. Well, you're if people mean. are being mean. <laughs> you know, I'm mean, not being mean. Mean people have to go. And you know how that works? How does that work? You know how that works? It works just like this. But I didn't do anything mean. Don't boot. Did you let, are you going to let her? Uh, I just, I, you know, I just couldn't resist doing it. 
that's just the way I am. But you know what? Elohim loves me. Elohim. She's gonna, hopefully she comes back in. <laughs> uh, well, what's up, our time's up anyway. Jackson? Oh, only it will be it will be pretty awesome if you give me the page, the exact page. Uh, I'll have Plus to tell I'm you searching. on Facebook. I'm Jackson, searching for it. Mm. Um, can we uh, can we uh, do this for another five minutes? Because there was one oh, final okay. question what that you might find interesting. Yeah, so if I could just make one quick announcement, and that yeah. is as for the Arimathea thing, I put a link up there on the chat. If you want to go out and listen to it, that explains the whole thing. Okay, I'm done. Okay, the final question was asked. I don't know if it was by Vicky or um, Melissa. But the question is, Epistle of Barnabas, is it scripture? Um, and about the eighth day, what does that mean? Oh, the so, eighth day. Okay, I'm doing a series of messages on that right now. In fact, I've done five four of them, and I'm doing the fifth tomorrow at the service. But Barnabas talks of the eighth day and another world. He's talking about the theory of the day to a thousand years since Adam. And if you just very briefly, I'll, I'll put you on a link if you want to go hear that one. But the eighth day is the day when a perfected world is turned over to the Father, the Creator. Now, it doesn't specifically say that, but that was the thought process of people in the first century that were believers. We find it in various other texts as well from the first and early second century. Barnabas is writing right after the fall of Jerusalem. So he's trying to regather the people of the Nazarenes and trying to put, put, the, put the band back together after thousands and thousands and actually millions of people are killed and carried off into slavery. And one of the things that he gives as the hope of the people is the eighth day. And he says that from when he's writing, 2,000 years will take us to the seventh day. And that theory talks about the seventh days being the millennium. Now, 2,000 years from then was, well, that was about 80 80 AD, so we're talking about uh, 2000, 80 AD, 1080, 2080. So it's somewhere around this time that he predicts that the millennium is going to begin. How it begins, is, I'll just have to put in an anti plug for dispensationalism because uh, the end time idea of the early Nazarenes had nothing to do with dis dispensational theology. And what, I hope you know what that means, but I'm talking about primarily the beast on earth in the 20th century and who's the beast and the big red dragon that comes down and all that stuff. That stuff, in my opinion, has already happened. And any thinking believer can see that it has if they read Revelation along with Josephus Jewish war. Too many similarities, too many things predicted in Revelation happened in Josephus and he was an eyewitness to it. So the seventh day is the day where the world is perfected. It takes a thousand years to do the judgment. It takes a thousand years to bring back all the resurrected people that ever were. And by the end of that day, uh, the, there is a, a, a satanic outbreak again from the pit. Evil has already been dispensed with, and that is conquered. And then the Messiah, on the eighth day, another world, he turns the globe over to his father. We don't know what happens then. So is it scripture? Um, Pistol of Barnabas. Oh, uh, absolutely it's scripture. The reason... It was, in fact, you go to the Sinaiticus New Testament, the earliest one we have, right there it is, right after Revelation. And it was cast out undoubtedly because it ends up, the last third of it, with interpretations of the Torah. What are Constantine Christians going to do with a third of a book of Torah? In fact, the whole book is about Torah and interpretation from the very beginning 
to the end. So that one was in, and the uh, people of the fourth century who gave you your wonderful canon took it out. And so, my, I have a translation of it that I give free from the Greek. It's fully annotated. I did the translation. I know it's great. Um, and it gives explanations for this and three other mysteries that everybody wonders about. If you want one, just let me know. I'll send it over to you. So sure. I'm going to quickly say my view on the subject very quickly. I believe Epistle of Barnabas is scripture. Epistle of Barnabas doesn't claim who wrote it, but tradition attributes the authorship to Barnabas. Recently, I've uh, the fact is, according to a set of apocryphal documents like the Acts of Barnabas and church, and church tradition, Barnabas died before the temple was destroyed, but the Epistle of Barnabas was clearly written after the temple was destroyed. So it could not have been, been written by that Barnabas. How do you know Barnabas died? We don't even know if Paul died yet. I'm saying according to the Acts of Barnabas and church, church tradition. So if they're correct, then that, that contradicts. But obviously, maybe Barnabas did live past, and um, and that that book, Acts of Barnabas and Church, Church Tradition, is wrong. That's certainly possible. But I'm siding with the Acts of Barnabas and Church Tradition, with Barnabas dying before the temple was destroyed. So I'm pretty sure that's a, a spurious book. It could, yeah, it Along could be. the Gospel of Barnabas. Well, Gospel of Barnabas, most, yeah, most uh, would yeah. say that's... Okay. Well, that's let me just say this. Opinion. Thank you. Let me just say this. I believe it was written by Barsabas. Barsabas? <laughs> yeah, Barsabas. Barsabas? Yeah, there, there okay. seems to be some confusion between the two. That um, sounds good. I like that. <laughs> and uh, Eighth Day, I think, I think from creation to the... Messiah's return will be 6,000 years. I think we haven't reached it yet. Then I think when the Messiah comes back, there will be a 1,000-year period. You know, Revelation speaks of 1,000 years. I interpret that literally. Not everybody interprets that literally, but I do. So that 1,000 years will be a Sabbath period, like the, seven, the six days of the week, the seventh day of the Sabbath, so also 6,000 years. And the seventh thousand year is a Sabbath period of rest that's what that seems to be what barnabas barnabas's interpretation is um, and then the eighth day according to hebrew thought and egyptian thought eight is infinity or eternity so the idea is that after the 1000 years the eternal life will will happen and every and you know and then judgment day and then it'll be eternal life from then on so that's my take on it Great. Well, I think we're, we're done now, and I thank you all for being here. Thank you, and Jackson, for hosting, and I welcome. appreciate, it. I appreciate you doing this every week. You're the greatest, man. You're, you have changed a lot in the last six, seven years that we've known each other. And I'm so glad to say that we've never had a, a disagreement that broke our friendship. We even did a debate one time. <laughs> We, that we talked about beforehand to see if we could get people on. And so we both chuckled about it when it was done. It was a good thing. Thank you no, all okay. for being here. And thanks a lot for everything. Take care. Yahweh be, be with you. Until no, next no, week. Shalom, guys.